Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast. I'm your host, Steph Bodrini. We provide straightforward information by bringing excellent guests with real world experience in all topics related to commercial real estate investing. And in today's episode, we are covering cost segregation with everyone needing last minute depreciation on all of the money that they made this year. I thought it would be a great idea to have someone discuss cost segregation, what are the pros, how you can uh, approach it, which classes may be better for bonus depreciation, and is it here to stay? We are chatting with Cindy Blumenfeld. She is the Director of Client Development at Engineered Tax Services. Here we go. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us today. Super somewhat last minute because uh, one of our investors had a lot of questions regarding cost segregation, and I thought it would be a great idea to share that with all of our listeners. But first, why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. Yep, I've been with uh, Engineer Tax Services for 13 years now. We're headquartered in downtown West Palm Beach, where I am, but we're nationally licensed. So we have clients all across the U.S. And um, I think you spoke a little bit about our firm, but we're a really unique company because we're a professionally licensed engineering firm with a tax expertise. So it's putting all the experts together <laughs> in order to maximize their investments. Oh, that is fantastic because there is the tax component of this entire thing as well. So glad to hear that. Let's jump into what is cost segregation and when should people get that study done? Great question. So for investment property, so just not the primary residence that you live in, but any investment property it could be commercial, it could be investment house or uh, an office condo that you're doing significant uh, leasehold improvements to. Uh, the IRS, for some reason, has commercial property being depreciated over 39 years. And residential, like apartment buildings, is 27 and a half. And what that means is that, let's say you spend $5 million to buy or build a building, not including land. Land isn't depreciable. Your CPA takes that $5 million and divides it by 39 years. And that's how much you can write off every year. And that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense or give the owners a whole lot of benefit. Um, none of the components in the building are lasting 30 or 40 years. So an alternate method, and not only approved by the IRS, but preferred by the IRS, is via an engineered cost segregation study. It's basically an engineering appraisal of the building for tax purposes. Our engineers break down every piece and part and component of that building down to the nuts and bolts. Like imagine your building as a dollhouse, turn it upside down, shake it. Everything is personal property because it can be removed and should be put to its appropriate class life. So carpeting, that's a five-year asset. There's seven-year assets, 15-year assets, 39-year assets. So we actually get most of our work from CPAs because they understand this, but most CPAs don't have in-house engineers to actually do the study. So by properly aligning all of the pieces, parts of that building, uh, these reports are forensic. They're hundreds of pages long. The CPA now has what they need to accelerate depreciation, i.e. cash flow for the commercial property owner. But there's so many layers of benefits with a cost segregation study. And, and they're not new, by the way. They've been around since the 80s, but they were for like the $100 million buildings. Now we do them all sizes, even a few hundred thousand and up. We could do it if somebody bought the building yesterday or if they bought it even five years ago, 10 years ago, and recapture all of that missed depreciation, even more money on the table now. So not only are they getting the accelerated depreciation cash flow benefit, but Oftentimes there's insurance benefits because we have the true replacement cost and depreciable life of these assets. Uh, it's a great benefit when somebody's planning renovations, as you know, when you own when you own things, you're always putting money into it. If it's buildings or cars or manufacturing equipment, you own things, you're constantly maintaining, repair, maintenance, updating, expanding. So as better things are coming into your building, you're putting in those new LED lights. Um, the old lights that are in the building need to be written off. So believe it or not, lights HVAC are 39-year assets per IRS. Even with a cost segregation study, that's their class life. 
nobody's had original lights in their building for 40 years. <laughs> so if they've right. owned their building for 10 years and now they're redoing their lights, that's, you know, 20, 30 years of net book assets that we can write off of those. Is bonus depreciation going away anytime soon or is question. that here to stay? Unfortunately, it's not here to stay. It's it's interesting with bonus depreciation. Some years they're here, some they're not. We have bonus depreciation now at 100%. And what that means is that, so when we break down a building component, as I mentioned before, we group them into the buckets per the IRS guidelines, five-year assets, seven, 15, 39. In years like now where there's 100% bonus depreciation, anything that's a 15-year asset or newer, you get to front load and take it year one. So let's say I were to get somebody um, a million dollar tax deduction, but they don't have that much of a tax liability that they can't utilize it. It just rolls forward on their books as a credit for future years so they don't lose it. So that's what bonus depreciation is. Next year, it's going down a bit and it's going to keep whittling down next year. It's going to, in 2023, it's going to be 80%. So of those... 15 year or newer assets, instead of 100% of them being front loaded, 80% of them is going to be front loaded, but still a tremendous benefit with our cost seg. I would say, you know, even without bonus depreciation, we're typically able to reclassify it and accelerate about 20 to 30% of uh, purchase price or build cost. Fantastic. Yeah, 80% still counts. Um, <laughs> With that in mind, I know that it can vary depending on asset class on a few different things, but is there a particular asset class that is more favorable for someone who needs that depreciation that year? That's an excellent question. We do all types of buildings. And just so you know, we do a complimentary benefit review. So all I need to provide our engineering department would be just the highlighted information, the property address, the purchase price, day type of building, if there's any renovations, things like this. And we'll look in, and do the, the benefit analysis. But basically, when you turn that building upside down and the more things that fall out of it, <laughs> those are all the things that we're going to reclassify. So, you know, warehouses, we do them all the time, but of course, there's going to be more benefits in maybe a multifamily or a retail store manufacturing facility that would have more different components inside it. I know uh, self-storage is a hot market right now. And depending on what the structures are made out of, if they're you know metal, aluminum, as opposed to concrete, they can be depreciated over a 15-year life. We do a lot of restaurants, McDonald's, for example, and the franchisees don't own the shell of the building, which is 39-year asset anyway, you can't accelerate it, but all, all the components inside the building. I had one McDonald's client still working with him, and we did a portfolio of eight locations, and he had, he had acquired them about five, six years prior to us doing this study. We were able to recapture all that missed depreciation, we gave him back over a million dollars cash. That's fantastic. Oh, well, so, all types of buildings. So that is the owner, right? Not the franchisee who leases That's the, the property. Yes, the franchisee yeah. leases the property because they own all of the equipment inside it, all the furnishings, the playgrounds. It's for the tenant or the owner or the leaseholder, depending on who's paying for the improvements, the renovation. If they're paying, they own the assets, it's on their books. They're the ones that do the cost segregation and get the benefit. This is a parenthesis that I am adding post interview here, especially for retail and office investors. When you are negotiating a lease with a new tenant, they are going to ask for TI money, tenant improvement allowance. So you need to do your calculations and figure out, should you do the tenant improvement and get the depreciation benefit? Or are you giving that as an actual allowance to that new tenant and they will be doing their improvements? This is all negotiable and whatever happens, it must be on the lease. Whoever is going to be taking that depreciation, you should be putting that on your lease. 
End of parenthesis. All right, so let's talk about renovations. Is that is it a good idea to do a cost segregation study if you are doing renovations on a property? It's a great idea to do a cost segregation study if you're doing renovations on a property. Yes, actually, two cost segregation studies. Possibly, we should do a cost segregation study on the purchase. Identify all the pieces, parts, and components of that building. Then, when you go in to do the renovation, you know what the pa- the reports are hundreds of pages long. It's worth the paper and the ink to print it out because <laughs> you're going to use that report for the life that you own that building. Go with a highlighter, highlight everything that you're pulling out of that building, taking out the carpeting, taking out the lights, replacing the windows, whatever it is. And then we have. Um, We call it PAD, partial asset disposition, or an abandonment study, whatever you want to call it. You're you're disposing of it. It should be written off of your books, and then you have the report to back it up. And then the new components that are coming in, those would be properly aligned and accelerated, if able, as well. So are there any other tips for investors to take advantage of depreciation that we haven't covered and you think is important for them to know? Well, we didn't talk about energy. So we also f- certify for the 179D and the 45L uh, energy certifications. This is for bigger commercial real estate. 45L is a tax credit. So we've been talking about um, depreciations, which is tax deduction. So if I got somebody a $500,000 tax deduction, they'd have to times that by their tax rate, and that's their net cash benefit. Whereas a tax credit is a dollar for dollar straight credit. So the 45L, it had expired. They're reinstating it as of January, and that's for large, low rise multifamily development. So three stories and under, and that would go to the developer. To a couple of thousand dollars per door or dwelling for designing with the ultimate energy efficiency. And then that's where we come in. It has to be certified by an engineer. And then the 179D has actually been out since 2006. It never really got the front page recognition it was due. It was a temporary incentive. It was out for a few years. It expired for a few years. They reinstated it, made it retroactive. It expired again for a few years, reinstated it, made it retroactive. It expired again. And it was just kind of going around like that for a while. And now they finally made it permanent. So that was really exciting. And that's a tax deduction for up to $1.80 per square foot, new construction or renovated buildings. And that's derived from three systems, 60 cents for lighting, 60 for HVAC, and 60 for the building envelope. So lighting's the low-hanging fruit, right? Everybody's putting in the LEDs. And uh, we stick with about 20,000 square feet and up for that. And again, we'll, you know, we work really closely with lighting designers and, and architects making sure that their design not only meets code, but meets the IRS specification so that they can get this extra tax incentive. And we see it being missed. People know about a utility rebate or a state incentive, but this is federal. So on this one, is that only for multifamily? I believe you said just multifamily. Is that correct, this benefit? Oh, 45L is just for new construction multifamily. 1790 is for all commercial buildings, 20,000 square feet and up is our threshold from a cost benefit and um, apartment buildings that are four stories and higher. But you got to love the IRS. They kind of give with one hand and take the other. Big changes (laughs) are coming. (laughs) And uh, as of January in 2023, in fact, our office is going to be hosting a webinar on this very shortly. Um, They're changing everything with the 179D. They're increasing the dollar amount, lowering some of the thresholds, but then making it more of a sliding scale where the more energy efficient your building is, the more cents per square foot you'll be able to get. So there's a lot of good things happening. And if anyone listening wants to follow me on LinkedIn, we're really good about posting all of the latest and greatest. And that was going to be my next question. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, Thank you so much. Well, definitely send me a request on LinkedIn, Cindy Blumenfeld, B-L-U-M-E-N-F-E-L-D. And you can also reach me on my direct line, 954-439-1671. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was such a wonderful episode. I really appreciate it.
I appreciate you. Thank you very much for having me. And if you haven't already, please make sure to write us a review on this podcast. If you are learning, if you find it valuable, it does take a great amount of time to find these incredible guests for us and edit and convert to blog posts and everything else. So I would really appreciate a review on the podcast app and I will see you next time.